Good morning and a very warm welcome to this EPC update, our regular look at developments in and around the European Union. My name is Jackie Davis. I'm a senior advisor to the European Policy Centre and with me this week, as always, Yanis Emanulides, Director of Studies at the European Policy Centre and Chief Executive Fabian Zulig. And our special guest this week, joining us later to discuss Germany's new government, the upcoming French presidential elections and what it all means for Europe, is Johannes Groibel, policy analyst at the EPC. Unfortunately, Sophie Pornschnegel couldn't join us, had to withdraw at the last moment, but it will be great to hear from Johannes later on. A couple of housekeeping points before we start. Most of you have been with us before an update and you know the drill. You are all muted for now, but if you want to ask a question orally, uh, click on the raised hands button and I will allow you to talk when the time comes. If you want to write your question, use the Q&A button, not the chat, the Q&A, and please be as brief as possible. You can use the chat button to communicate with our marvellous team behind the scenes if you are having any technical issues. So we're going to start today because we must, given the situation, uh, with COVID. Um, and I can never say this new word, Omicron. I don't know, it doesn't roll off the tongue very easily. I wonder why they chose this one. Um, also sounds rather peculiar, but uh, this of course has, we talked about this at the last update, uh, where the situation was looking serious, but not utterly grim. Now things have taken a turn dramatically for the worse. Yanis, uh, where are we? Uh, and in terms of the reaction across Europe to the discovery of this new variant uh, and its spread, because it now appears to be in many EU countries already. I mean, uh, Charles Michel had wanted to hold an EU summit today, a virtual summit. It's not happening. Why not? Where are we? Well, first of all, I think that um, when you look back, back over the past months and you were listening carefully to epidemiologists, this was exactly the situation they were fearing, they were warning us about. That you would on the one hand have uh, an infection surge, which we have uh, on the basis of Delta, um, and at the same time have a newly highly infectious variant of the, of the virus um, hitting our societies. Uh, and Omicron is exactly that. It is a highly infectious variant of the, of, of the virus. Um, now, having said that, we are already seeing all the negative pictures. We're seeing the dramatic situations uh, in hospitals throughout Europe. Um, so I think, but we still need to be careful. We need to be careful and don't rush into early conclusions because if you look into the situation, uh, the Omicron situation, especially you have more open questions than you have answers with respect to the transmission, the severity of Omicron, uh, with respect to the effectiveness of vaccines, of testing, um, of therapeutics. There are also, there are so many questions uh, which still need to be answered it won't take too much time, but we still need to give us the time to answer some of these questions in order then to think of reactions. Um, we have first indications that the symptoms of Omicrons might be milder, but then again, a lot of those who have been affected up till now have been younger people. Um, we have first indications, um, or we, we're not sure, sorry, how strong um, the vaccines will provide uh, security to those who have been vaccinated. Um, so that's not clear yet. There are differences of opinion. You hear differences of opinion that needs to be clarified. Um, we know that it is very contagious, um, but at the same time, uh, we also see that a lot of people who already have gone through it have been reinfected by the new variant. Um, and there are more questions which are out there. And I think that that's also one reason um, by the virtual, why the virtual uh, summit did not take place because you have more questions uh, than answers. And thus, if you would now have had EU leaders coming together, taking decisions on the basis of where we are now, I think would have probably not sent a clear signal. But individual governments are having to take yes. very quick decisions. We have another meeting here in Belgium today, only a week after the last, uh, to discuss what to do. We've seen Germany impose much yes. tougher restrictions on the unvaccinated. We're, so people are responding. Has there been to date, really, Yanis, both in terms of travel bans? We saw that immediate announcement of travel bans on people coming from certain African countries. But both in terms of those travel bans and lockdowns, restrictions, has there been any really effective coordination at EU level, or for the moment, given the speed with which everyone's had to react, is it really country by country? 
there are certain coordinations which are taking place um, also with respect to the uh, COVID certificate. Um, however, in general, if you look into the overall picture, we see that something which we have seen also in the past, that we see different reactions, that we see different pace of reactions, that we see different instruments being used at in different member states, but also within different member states. Um, so in many ways, we see that there is a, a very diverse reaction uh, to the new situation, which in some ways is also understandable, given all the uncertainties uh, which we're having. On the other hand, I hope that we will have and continue to have uh, taken the right lessons from previous phases of the crisis, that we need to have a stronger level of coordination. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that we're having a summit in a couple of weeks, I think is good news because this will provide an opportunity health ministers are getting together uh, also next week to discuss. So there is a coordination. However, having said that, we already see that there is a lot of commonness of what is happening with respect to the new situation. One is, as you already indicated, there's increased pressures and calls on those who have not been vaccinated to get vaccinated. Um, you see de facto lockdowns uh, of now non-vaccinated in a good number of member states, uh, 2G, 2G plus uh, rules being put in place. Um, you were already mentioning the mandatory vaccination. Ursula von der Leyen has, Ursula von der Leyen has called for a discussion about the issue and we will yeah. see that discussion but you see that some member states are already moving forward the austrian have taken a general decision uh, the greeks will uh, have uh, put in place a mandatory vaccination with people above 60 um, in other countries including france for example you have sector specific um, mandatory vaccinations okay. in germany there are similar intents yeah. you see that this is one thing which is in common and i see also that there are other things where it's, where there is commonness um, Fabian, I mean, this is this debate is moving very fast, particularly on mandatory vaccines. A few weeks ago, most people were, were, were not considering that at all. And suddenly we are where we are now. You, before the summer, uh, talked about how important that the COVID certificate was going to be. You said it is a big test for the European Union. It has to work to allow free movement again. Um, and it did. And it's been hailed as a success. Are you worried now? Um, the Commission had been trying to sort of go for an approach now that was much more individually based. Uh, people who are vaccinated and people who are not, rather than country based, region based. That seems to have been put on hold for now because of Omnicom. Are you worried that the COVID certificate uh, is in jeopardy because of this varied response? And if so, what would the consequences be? Um, I, I think we we need to see how, how things develop. I mean, clearly there is a challenge and it's not just um, the immediate question of, of traveling. There's also the question about how we deal with boosters, um, how we deal uh, with different age groups, um, the question of um, young people, children, um, and how that will work. Um, it's already uh, a question for many people who are traveling. Um, what happens if you're traveling with a family uh, and you don't have uh, vaccination for some of them or if you don't have uh, the booster for some of them? So I think that there's a lot of coordination which has to happen to continue the success story of the COVID certificate. And I think we will also see individual country action and that needs to be then uh, explained and coordinated uh, i think the other part where we have to coordinate um, much better um, and we haven't done it enough so far is the question of the global response um, yes we have a certain level of uh, european involvement in in the global processes but what Omicron clearly shows is that this is far from over unless we are starting to get much more of a grip uh, of the, the, um, the, the virus also in those parts of the world where vaccination is very low at the moment. But you said you do expect to see individual country action. Does that mean you expect within the EU that we will see restrictions uh, as we did last winter on moving between EU countries on moving between regions within countries? I think it gets very difficult um, to have a completely free movement if you have a very different approach in different countries. So if you have, for example, um, quite severe restrictions on unvaccinated in some countries, uh, that's very different um, from a situation where you have a lockdown for the whole population. And clearly you have to then also coordinate um, what does that mean in terms of people coming in or leaving the country. Um, mm -hmm. So there will be more challenges, um, but I think it is 
manageable and also I think um, the populations by and large, even though we have seen some protests, but by and large the populations are supportive and understand that this is something which has to be done because of the virus. I think what is, is becoming more of an issue uh, in terms of population acceptance is uh, the differences in how unvaccinated are treated mm -hmm. between different countries um, and whether there is a consistency in that. And indeed, I mean, you say that people largely understand, but one of the, the, the issues here is trying to encourage more people to get vaccinated. If you go for generalised lockdowns, there are many people saying, well, why did I bother uh, if I'm now treated the same? So there is a growing division in society. Yanis, do you share uh, Fabian's belief that this probably will lead to some restrictions on freedom of movement, uh, travel bans and banning entry of certain people? Uh, and will it be just the unvaccinated if it is? Or do you fear or, or think we may be moving to more? Because as we know, vaccinated people can get the virus and they can pass it on. So if we're talking about controlling the spread of the new variant could be an issue. How do you see that? Well, we're already seeing that there are restrictions. The question is, how far will they go? And exactly. how far will individual members go? And how will that uh, affect the overall system? And that's why I started uh, when answering to your first question by saying, there are all these uncertainties. Um, if we see that the new variant, that Omicron, um, in terms of its actual effects on people is milder in terms of the symptoms than the uh, Delta has been, obviously this changes the equation. Um, if we see that it does affect those who have gone through COVID-19 already with other variants, that they will get reinfected by Omicron, uh, obviously this also change the, uh, changes the game. Um, so there is a lot of uncertainty and that's why the, this makes it so difficult to navigate your way, to take decision at this present point in time. Um, and, and the worse it will become, which is an hypothesis. I'm not saying it will become as worse, but the worse it will become, uh, the more difficult it will be not to put in place restrictions, which then also might affect travel. Having said that, I don't see us going back to a regime which we've had before we had the certificate, when we were in full lockdown, because as you were indicating, member states, governments, but also I think the EU in total will be very much looking forward to making people get vaccinated, which means you need a differentiation between non-vaccinated and vaccinated people, um, and that you will try to set up in place this, what people call a quasi lockdown for those who have not been vaccinated. So if you then restrict travel, for example, for those who have done what they have been told to do, including also the booster shot, because if you put our, yourselves months ahead, we were talking, we were talking about people who will, who will have to have had a, a booster shot, um, then you cannot, uh, but leave them also continue to do things which others cannot do, which includes also travel. Indeed. Uh, Fabian, you wanted to come in here. Um, ju just to say that um, we should also bear in mind that uh, the difficulties we're seeing now um, might be aggravated by Omicron, but we were already facing some of these questions beforehand. And yeah. uh, the key question of uh, the pressure on health systems, the pressure on intensive care, uh, which is directly linked to vaccination rates. Um, that was something which had to be addressed beforehand. And I think what we are seeing now in many countries is the taboos of uh, three, four months ago are actually going very quickly. Um, that people are talking about mandatory vaccination um, or that at least the, the measures are very strong uh, for unvaccinated um, because of the impact this is having on the health systems. Mm. It is striking. Uh, European Medical Medicines Agency has underlined that it is ready if we require changes to the vaccines, new vaccines to cope with the new variant. They say their approvals process is ready to move quickly. So we wouldn't um, hopefully see any of those criticisms that we saw, many of them unfounded, but nevertheless, that slower rollout that we saw uh, in the EU last year. Year. But Fabian, there's one other question I want to touch on before we move on, and that is the impact of all of this. You have warned time and time again that people are underestimating the profound impact that this pandemic has had on Europe's economy. Uh, it was fragile. It was faltering. Uh, and now we see in the last few days serious cases of market jitters because of Omicron. Um, how do you see the impact now? Where are we? What are the numbers telling us about the state of the economy and what impact this could have? Um, 
as with with the, the virus itself, um, there's an enormous amount of uncertainty about exactly what kind of impact um, this is going to have. Um, but what we've already seen, um, and that was already a worry even before Omicron, but what we've already seen is to some extent that the rebound effect, that the freeing of the economy, uh, which happened after the, the lockdowns, has somewhat stalled. Um, and that is a major concern because that also means that uh, the, the whole releasing um, of uh, economic activity, uh, which has taken place, might uh, not have the effect which we wanted. So are we going to have to go back in some areas um, to, for example, um, some form of employment programs um, for those people who cannot do their work anymore? At the moment, we still have the attempt to keep everything open. Um, but for example, if you have to close the hospitality sector down again, um, then you will have to also find the support uh, for that sector. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is part of, of the consideration going forward. And we shouldn't also forget that there are other pressures on the economy as well. There are global mm -hmm. pressures. Um, there's energy prices, uh, which are having a big effect. There are inflationary tendencies now, um, which are particularly worrying um, people in Germany. So there, there is actually a lot of um, uncertainty in economic trajectory. I'm likely to translate, Yanis, I'll bring you in in a moment, but Fabian, likely to translate also into calls for more EU action on the economy, or do you think that's not uh, in focus at the moment? They're still obviously implementing the recovery and resilience facility and so on, but do you expect more calls from some countries for EU action? Um, I think it's inevitable that there will be more calls um, also if you have a differential effect. I mean, the part of the, the uncertainty is also about the timing. So, for example, if we are in a situation by the summer where we have restrictions, um, then certainly the tourism dependent countries will call for more support. Um, so it depends a bit on how it develops. Um, but I think in general, there's not going to be uh, a major a new initiative at this moment. Um, I, I think we're not going to, to see that there's not the political will. I think what is what this is doing um, is actually fueling the debate about the longer term. So the questions of what is going to be needed, um, are we really talking when we're talking about recovery and resilience about a time limited uh, program or are we talking about something which is actually much more about the long-term structural changes uh, which we need to have in the European economy. Absolutely, and you mentioned the tourism sector, of course, uh, this for the moment uh, not moving more decisively towards an individuals based uh, approach rather than a country approach, obviously has biggest implications for the tourism industry uh, and those countries. But uh, a last thought from you, Yanis, on this. And just just on. in addition to what Fabian was saying, because obviously he was right that uh, making an economic prognosis in such and certain times is almost impossible. However, having said that, I think there were some voices that were by far not a majority. They were a minority, but there were voices who were increasingly saying, well, maybe the economic situation is not as negative as, it, as we thought it would have been. Maybe we could already uh, think of how we're going to exit the crisis, also in economic terms. What do we really need to do? additional measures, how should the ECB deal with the situation, also a view of certain inflation fears and risks which are out there. But I think what the current situation shows us, and I think the next upcoming weeks and months will show us, we are by far not out of the situation. So all these measures which we have put in place need to be implemented, they need to be forcefully implemented. Uh, and this is, I think, something which is being, which the situation is showing us. Just one last remark, because I think it's important. Um, when the first reaction to the crisis was travel restrictions on South Africa and on countries of, South and, uh, of, of Southern Africa in general. And I think we should say bravo to them. We say we should we mm -hmm. congratulate them for the fact that they informed everyone about developments in their country, that they were not hiding anything, um, which is something which we've seen happening in the past. And they did this during the season, which now is in South Africa, their summer season. Yeah. It is where they are now dependent on tourism and still, they were outspoken about it, so we should not um, uh, not be negative on them and put pressures on them, which worsens their situation, while at the same time they have 
treated us and they, they were very fair and they, we, they were extremely forthcoming in sharing all the information they have and still are with us. And I think this is something we should applaud. Thank you very much indeed. We do have to move on, but uh, we will be back. Our next EPC update will be on the afternoon of December the 17th after the EU summit. And we will, of course, then discuss and analyze for you what has happened in relation to the COVID situation uh, in those discussions. But we're going to move on now. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome Johannes Groibel, EPC policy analyst for this discussion. We want to talk about some major political developments in the European Union as Angela Merkel uh, continues what I think is increasingly becoming the long goodbye. Last night there was a military farewell uh, and the French presidential election campaign is hotting up. First round of voting on the Republican candidate last night produced a shock result uh, with uh, Michel Barnier and Xavier Bertrand. Xavier Bertrand particularly a favourite in the early days, uh, both losing out and now we see uh, a new uh, pairing for the runoffs uh, of Eric Ciotti uh, and Valérie Prescott. Um, and so we are in a we're in a very strange situation with the French elections, not sure where we're going. But let's start with Germany, because, as I say, the long goodbye is nearly over uh, and we will see Olaf Scholz coming to Brussels, the new chancellor in December, December the 17th, 16th and 17th for that summit. Um, generally, Johannes, um, where do you expect, we'll come specifically to the EU issues, but broadly, in terms of tone, in terms of substance, where do you expect this traffic light coalition to be significantly different to the government that Angela Merkel presided over? And where do you think it will be pretty much business as usual? Well, thanks, Jackie, um, for having me and for the warm welcome. Um, well, I would say the coalition partners were very eager to portray um, that this new coalition and the new coalition agreement is um, a fresh start after 16 years of Merkel. And I think they're rightly so, it is a new start, but still that doesn't mean that there won't be at least some form of continuity um, in certain aspects. Um, for example, we can expect at least to some extent um, continuity with respect to a fiscal discipline, um, uh, Yes, there is. There are strong pledges in the agreement on uh, investment, on renewal. But at the same time, we have um, with Scholz a relatively frugal social democrat as a chancellor, and additionally, of course, uh, the liberal um, Christian Lindner, who uh, um, managed to secure the finance ministry, and um, of course, also with the coalition agreement pledging for um, this fiscal discipline. Um, but overall, I would say we do see a new start. Um, uh, we can see that, uh, for example, in a bigger social dimension, uh, um, raising the minimum wage to uh, uh, 12 uh, euros. Um, uh, we uh, see a more ambitious environmental policy, and of course, a key topic um, on, uh, of the Greens. And um, uh, yeah, the Greens have secured nearly all ministries uh, that will be directly linked to this uh, green transition uh, so they will have a big role in this um, transition um, we will see the government that will be tougher on the rule of law especially with in the context of uh, hungary and poland and uh, we will see a new approach to um, the state and and um, democracy per se with uh, citizens panels that will be used um, to advise the parliament uh, on concrete questions, we will see uh, increased transparency of a lobby reg register and also the, the efforts to uh, uh, decrease the voting age to 16. But I guess in the end, the biggest um, change is uh, this traffic light coalition per se. We will have for the first time that three entirely different parties will form a coalition together, um, especially with the Greens and the FDP, the Liberals, two parties that have been, not been very close uh, to each other in the past. Um, so that will mean that this coalition will need some time to be able to work, to be worked together. Um, and also, yeah, the stability will be tested. Um, but it is interesting, Johannes. I mean, they put together this coalition agreement. Some people said for precisely that reason, it was going to be really difficult. Uh, to come up with an agreement. And nevertheless, they did. They did it in time. Um, what do you read into that? Is it something to do with, with um, style, approach? What was, what's the key factor that enabled them to come to an agreement in German terms relatively efficiently and quickly? Well, I, I think the, 
there were these efforts um, to say we don't want to repeat um, what what has been the case uh, four years ago with these uh, disastrous coalition talks um, resulting in in the FDP uh, um, uh, leaving the table and uh, there were the, the, these efforts from especially the FDP um, to uh, to uh, signal um, very early on that this won't happen again, this should not happen again. And we see we saw a very completely um, a different dynamic in uh, coming to these uh, to this agreement with first uh, the, the liberals and the, the, the greens coming together before actually consulting with, with the social democrats, the, the bigger partner, uh, to exactly avoid this, um, uh, this uh, yeah, development that we have seen um, uh, four years ago. So yes, it is a it is a success um, that this these three parties could come together and that um, they uh, th they did so uh, relatively early on and um, but it was there was also this signal function that yeah. these three parties wanted to convey exactly that message. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, uh, um, Giva Hofstadt uh, has written an article in which he had said the Merkel break uh, on progress in the EU is now off. Um, is he right? Do you read it in that way? What do you expect in general terms and specifically on EU issues? Let me start by adding uh, some things to what Johanna said, because I think what is important to um, have in mind when you witness what has happened in Germany in the coalition talks is that we see that there is a totally different coalition culture. Mm -hmm. These are three parties that came together rather swiftly, worked out a coalition agreement, did this very secretively, this was something which we haven't seen from in, in, in ages in German coalition talks. Um, the news about what was discussing within closed doors was not spreading to the media immediately. They were secretive uh, and they knew that this is a basis for the success. Um, they had differences. They were able to overcome these differences also because they know that there was no alternative. This is the only coalition which was possible because the CDU, CSU now is in, especially the CDU, is in disarray and they need to get their house in order in, in the party itself. Um, but they also knew that if they get this together, and this is also, I think, a basic uh, starting point which Schultz inserted into this uh, coalition talk is if we get our act together, this is not only about now, it's also about in four years time we can establish ourselves as a viable long-term alternative to governments which are led or include the city of Tesu. So there is a strong incentive, but let's not forget, all this has been happening in this different culture still needs to be tested because it has been happening in the honeymoon period. Indeed. And we can already see because the differences between the parties are huge, that that creates also discussions within the party individually. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yes, you have this honeymoon, you have a different culture, you have Schultz who has a different approach. He's not trying to get the limelight towards himself like Angela Merkel always did. Uh, he, he leaves room to the coalition partners. But what happens when the honeymoon gets well and ended? Are the, and, 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 and you get okay, Fabian, are the breaks off as Eva Hofstadt would have it? Do you expect a significant difference uh, at EU level? And picking up particularly on one of the things that Johannes was talking about when he talked about that pledge of fiscal discipline, uh, the coalition agreement does be talk about being open to reform of the Stability and Growth Pact. Do you expect um, a significantly different line on that or will it be more business as usual? I think firstly, um, the idea that um, progress in Europe depends um, on one person, um, I think is a little bit fanciful. Um, uh, the idea that somehow the Merkel uh, was standing there, stopping the tide of change. Um, I think the reality is much more that uh, we have a lot of difficulties in agreeing exactly what way we want to move. Um, so it is um, much more difficult to make progress now than it may might have, have been in the past. Um, I do expect that uh, there will be a new impetus um, from the coalition um, because also um, the different coalition partners will want to establish themselves in Europe. Um, I think depending also on the party, but they, they will want to be seen as progressive in Europe. They have already talked about some of the issues which they see as being important, 
which is not only um, classical European policy. I mean, for example, one of the interesting aspects is now how this new coalition is going to approach relationship uh, with uh, countries like Russia, countries like mm -hmm. China, uh, which is also going to have an impact on, on uh, the European Union. But I think the key question will remain um, what happens um, at the Franco-German level. Um, will you be able to find some form uh, of uh, common vision going forward, um, despite the differences within the German coalition? Um, and that could then well, very well lead to changes to the stability and growth pact. Um, but for me, I think this is much more about trying to find a common narrative, um, which um, works within the coalition, but then also works at the European level. And I think we have started to see some of that, that we've actually shifted the debate from a debate around fiscal rules, around um, uh, the, the kind of austerity debate we've had in the past, to a debate which is much more focused on investment, investment in new technologies, investment in uh, sustainability in particular. And that is an agenda which can also work for all the coalition partners. Uh, so it depends a bit on how this is framed. Um, but of course, we will have to wait and see what happens in the French presidential election, um, because if it is not Macron, um, then it will be a very different case. We'll come back on that. But Johannes, just to follow uh, pick up on a couple of more specific points relating to the EU and the way the EU works, there is in the coalition agreement, as I understand it, uh, support for transnational lists in elections. Uh, there is a support for returning to the Spitzenkandidaten process. Uh, also talk about a stronger European external action service. So there are areas, I don't know what it says about the Conference on the Future of Europe, for example, uh, whether you see a bigger commitment now uh, to that process or more enthusiasm for it. How do you read? Uh, are we seeing a broadly more integrationist government than we have in the past? Yes, I think you can you can definitely uh, um, say that in, in two ways. Um, we, we have a more integrationist, more reformist um, a government with respect to, uh, um, to uh, European issues um, in its overall direction. I mean, you already said um, uh, we see the pledge for um, transnational lists. Um, uh, we see a, um, a more federalist approach. We see more support indeed for the conference on the future of Europe, where um, the coalition agreement says that um, the parties believe that the conference should end up in reforms um, and especially that it should lead to a, to a convention um, uh, that uh, could then also uh, lead to treaty changes. And um, which is, I guess, something that has never happened before to that extent, uh, calling um, for the European Union to be developed in a federal union um, along the line. But also, apart from that, we'll see pledge, we see pledges for um, EU reform um, with, re with respect to uh, um, strengthening the European Parliament. Um, but um, also, it's not just that a pro-European narrative. What, what um, is a second uh, important observation, I would say, when, when reading through um, the, the coalition treaty, not just the, the Europe chapter, but the coalition treaty as such, is that the EU is seen as more of a cross-cutting issue. Um, we, when you, especially when you compare the new coalition agreement with the agree, uh, agreement from four years ago, you see that Europe plays a bigger role in all the chapters, not only uh, the Europe chapter. Um, and that will especially be important when it comes to uh, economic policies, uh, green transformation, digital, uh, and, and of course also migration. Um, there, um, uh, yeah, Europe is, is a part in all of these chapters. And um, uh, the agreement also gives Europe a bigger role in national legislative processes, um, including a commitment to, uh, for example, always check if a proposed national me measure could not be, be tackled more effectively on the European level. And of course, that's not a guarantee yet whether Europe is indeed being, uh, being treated as a cross-cutting cost, cost, issue in the next four years, but it's the first indication. And, and by the way, also the fact that 
uh, Franziska Brandner, who uh, um, used to be the green spokesperson for Europe in the last um, Bundestag, uh, their top experts in, in European affairs, is not going to be a, a secretary of state for, for Europe, as many expected, but will be a, um, a secretary of state in the Ministry for Econ Economy and Climate Protection, with a key role in the digital and okay. a green transformation, making that link to European level is, I think, uh, um, an important sign for this cross-cutting approach. Thank you. Question from our audience, from uh, Mikhail Freitag, saying, how do you assess the view of the new German government on social Europe, looking at potential frictions between the SPD and the Liberals? Uh, I don't know, Johannes, can you pick up on that, just following up on what you were just saying? I mean, there there is um, more social Europe in uh, um, the, the coalition agreement. Um, there, there is a pledge to uh, implement and further develop the, the social pillar, but um, the, the coalition agreement is rather, um, rather short on, on the topic of, of social Europe, uh, uh, maybe also in the context of, of um, uh, these uh, divisions. Actions, you see that yeah. in, in different uh, policy areas, that there are still differences between the party which are avoided in, in the coalition treaty. Absolutely. Um, Yanis, please do react to that. But also, if I could just throw in a question in the interest of time. The EPC has been publishing a series of essays uh, looking at Germany after Merkel from the perspective of different member states. What do you think other member states are looking for? Uh, there is obviously concern. We'll come back to how Olaf Scholz may behave at summits in a moment. But concern that the departure of Angela Merkel was an anchor of stability for the EU and it's gone. What do you think other member states are looking to this new government to do? Let me start with something else and then I'll come to that. <laughs> um, because I think that uh, Johannes is right. If you read through this coalition agreement, it is an extreme federalist, uh, European federalist um, uh, coalition agreement, which also sets out some concrete, very specific uh, ambitions. Um, and uh, Johannes mentioned many of them. Um, and by the way, the fact that, you know, Europe goes throughout the document is positive. And also that the Europe chapter comes on page 131. It doesn't come as it did in the last coalition agreement as the first chapter, which I think was in many ways trying to create a narrative while also being a lot symbolic. Um, now it comes later, but it has, it has substance and it's written by a federal pen. Okay. But the question is, will actually this coalition government stick to this? Uh, because this is on paper. Will it stick to it, especially when the going gets tough? When individual members of this coalition, I mean parties, will see that they might be suffering in terms of uh, what the polls are telling them. Uh, if the CDU gets stronger, who will it take votes away from? Potentially from the FDP. How will, how will that potentially uh, change the stance? There's a lot of dynamics so there's to, lot of dynamic to look at. Um, the other point is, um, and that's the more positive one, you now have a strong basis for finding a, a new agreement with Paris. And I think it will be interesting because you already mentioned the conference, which is explicitly mentioned in the document and saying that it should lead to a constitutional convention so that there will be something which comes after the conference, whether the Germans and the French will, before the end of the conference, find an agreement on basically how, where they want to push things beyond the conference. Um, and that part, this, this, this window is now open, okay. um, but it will be under pressure from the, from the, from the French elections. Now two with words, respect to the- Two yes. words on other member states, and then I want to come to Fabian. I think that many of them are in a, a wait and see uh, moment, uh, because after 16 years of Angela Merkel, this is a major transition. They want to get to know also Olaf Scholz himself, um, the other heads of state and government in the European Council need to get him, get to know himself personally. And we know that at that level, that also matters. They will also want to see how he will position himself with respect to some of the concrete issues which now need to be addressed. And also with respect to some of the concrete tough cookies that need to be expressed. And I think the first real test will be when the EU enters a severe crisis and it might be COVID, might also be something else of how he will position himself and how he will be able to get his coalition government, which is a very complex coalition government, behind his back. Thank you. Fabian, um, just picking up on that point, um, how would you expect, what can we expect from what we know of the man? Uh, we've talked a lot about the substance of what this government will do, but in terms of his style, his approach, when he is at the EU negotiating table, quite struck, you identified 
why the coalition talks work so well, why it was effective. Does that give us any clues? Because I imagine forming a German coalition government's a bit like negotiating at 27 when in terms of its complexity. Do we get any clues from that of how he will behave, what his approach will be when he comes to EU summits and in general in EU negotiations? Um, just one, one point, um, also referring back to the Liberals, the FDP, um, I think it's a big question of how big a role they actually will want to play at the European level. Um, I think clearly um, the Greens will, uh, and there's a lot of linkages also in terms of personnel uh, between the Greens and uh, the European level. Um, but what we have seen in the past has been that European policy hasn't been treated as foreign policy. It's been part of what the Chancellor has dealt with. Um, and that also um, is, is a question of how Scholz will approach this. Will he be the one who sees himself very much as making European policy or uh, representing the coalition? Um, uh, and that for, for me is, is an open question at the moment, but we shouldn't forget that Scholz has a lot of experience um, also at the European level. He also has a lot of connections. I mean, he knows, for example, Macron from his time as, as finance minister. So there, there is a connection already there. Um, and I would expect that uh, also because he represents the biggest country, uh, he will play a major role uh, in, in future summits. Uh, we will already um, see him being in that role um, by the end of this year. Um, but I think what should also be emphasized is that uh, Europe will also miss Merkel. So I think maybe going back to the Verhofstadt comment, um, I don't see it quite as, um, as black and white as that, because in the end, Merkel has al always been the one who's also been able to pull people together, find the compromise, um, to make sure that things kept moving, um, even in very difficult times. Uh, and that crisis role, dealing with that immediate uh, issue when things look very, very difficult. Um, at the moment, we don't have anyone at that uh, in that kind of function at the European level. Maybe Scholz will grow into it, um, but it's a big ask. Absolutely. I uh, want to move on in a moment to the French presidential elections and then back to the Franco-German relationship, which Fabian underlined. Uh, but first, Johannes, on this style, on this approach, then I'm going to bring in a question from John Palmer. John, I'll open your mic in a moment. But Johannes, on this style question. Yeah, I think um, actually to, to some extent or, or in, in some parts, um, there is actually some at least some parallels between uh, Schultz and, and Merkel in, in the style of conducting negotiations. At least that's what um, several former coalition partners um, of, his, um, of his governments um, uh, yeah, said publicly. Um, he uh, is uh, someone that on the European level, uh, but in, in negotiations in general, tends to uh, um, keep it um, uh, as open as possible um, for as long as possible, not to take a position to too early to keep his option open, but uh, be, uh, be very, very firm on, on the negotiate, uh, negotiating table um, um, yeah, internally. Um, so uh, um, I think to that in, in that context you can uh, draw some parallels. But um, may, maybe uh, um, before we move on to uh, to uh, the French, um, uh, one last um, comment because we were uh, very positive about uh, reforms um, from uh, from the new German government. But um, at at the same time, I want to uh, um, raise a voice of caution in that respect because um, I think. Uh, at least in the in the short term future, um, the domestic of the new government will not be on the Europe. Uh, the, the the focus of the new government will not be on the European level. It will be uh, um, yeah. on the domestic uh, context, especially uh, with the surge of COVID, um, with yeah the relatively um, unsuccessful start of the of the coalition in in this respect in in target in COVID. Um, the focus of the government will be. Um, getting inevitably, in inevitably. In Thank you. Yanis, 30 seconds, if you would, because I want to bring in John and then I want to move on to France. Just a bit of a disagreement with Fabian, because I think that the FDP 
uh, will not be able to hide itself from European issues and that the uh, that EU affairs will be high on the agenda and that they will also have to position themselves. Um, and what is interesting to see is that in the coalition agreement, they have agreed that they would repurpose um, pandemic uh, emergency funds um, for the future to, to put money into all the investment uh, which they have which they have in mind. And that might send a strong, strong signal also to other countries to follow the same line. And it will be interesting Interesting to see how the FTP will then react if others follow a line which they are now opening while having in mind that we all have to be think of depth sustainability. So that's just one example where we will see that, that the FTP okay. will be pushed into the corners and then it will have to out itself in terms of certain okay. difficult things. Let's take a couple of questions from the audience, then I want to move to the French elections. John Palmer, uh, please unmute yourself and away you go. Thank you very much. Um, my question really follows on a little bit what Yanis has just said. <clears throat> Even from the very beginning <clears throat> of the European Union, federalism was a word that people dare not breathe its name too much in, 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 in interstate, intergovernment relations. My question is this, the Franco-German relationship has always been, of course, determined, very, very influential. Are we seeing that bilateral relationship to turn into something of a more multilateral relationship, bringing in, for example, into the core leadership, Italy, Spain, one I might imagine, Portugal, etc. In other words, the driving kernel is itself um, looked likely to expand given the outcome of the election. Thank you. John, I'm going to hold that question, if I might, for a moment, because I'd like to just bring the French elections into the picture and then put the two together. Uh, so I'll put that panel to that question to the panel after we've talked briefly about the French elections. But uh, Milan Nick says, how do you see the EU, Germany and France in particular, prepared to deal with the escalating crisis between Russia and Ukraine uh, after a de facto ending of the Normandy format? And related question, what do you expect from the upcoming EU Eastern Partnership Summit, the first EU format that Olaf Scholz will attend as German Chancellor. Again, let's hold on to that for a moment because they all really link particularly to that uh, Franco-German relationship um, on the French presidential elections. And let's not get into the ins and outs of French domestic politics. I mean, as I mentioned, though, we did have that surprise result last night. Uh, the runoff will now be between the hardliner Eric Ciotti and the more mainstream candidate Valérie Pécresse, but no Xavier Bertrand no Michel Barnier. It's going to be intensely fought. It is said that uh, President Macron fears uh, Valérie Précresse uh, a lot more than he would uh, Eric Ciotti or any of the other candidates. Um, to what extent, Fabian, do you think um, the French presidential campaign uh, is going to make it almost impossible for the French to run a good EU presidency at the same time? Or do you think they can um, walk and chew gum, as the Americans like to say, at the same time? What's the impact of one on the other, do you think? And particularly a word, if you would, on whether issues like the migrant row between the UK and the French now, um, was that about French presidential election campaign in terms of Macron's reaction to what the Brits uh, said and did, uh, or would, would that have happened under any circumstance? How do you see this interplay between presidential elections and EU presidency? Same question to you all, and then we'll come back to the Franco-German question. Um, I think we have to distinguish um, when it comes to the presidency between uh, doing, if you like, the technical day-to-day um, and then the, the, the bigger vision, the question of uh, does it give a future strategic direction? Um, I think the day to day, I, I wouldn't be worried about. I think um, France has the capacity to deal with that. And um, we've seen in the past that also you can have um, essentially caretaker uh, presidencies, which still move the, the agenda along. Um, when it comes to the more political, the, the more strategic uh, question, I think a lot will depend on what kind of response um, Macron will get uh, in terms of the reaction from the other member states and particularly now from Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, this is something where he can use the French presidency as a platform uh, to contrast himself um, to some of the other candidates uh, to show that as he did in his first election, um, 
that France is back and it's at the center of the European Union, it's driving the agenda of the European Union. And that's something which I think he will judge uh, to be positive for his campaign. If it looks like things are getting bogged down, that there is no progress, um, that uh, some of the flagship activities uh, don't look very attractive, uh, then I think he will play it rather more quietly. So it very much depends, uh, in my view, of whether he thinks it's going to be a successful presidency, which will make it a successful presidency. Thank you, Yannis. I think we're going to see, um, well, first of all, Fabian is right. In terms of the day-to-day -day operations, we've seen in other presidency, council presidencies, that things do still work. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that. But I think in terms of the six months and the bigger outlook, I think you're going to have three phases. You're going to have January and February, uh, where you will have a government strong in place, trying to also set its mark. Uh, depending on what will be on the European agenda, it might be all COVID, we don't know. Uh, but they will try to set their mark. Then you will have March, April, which will be the high phase of the presidential election campaign, where I doubt that uh, Macron's interest will be to push European issues to the forefront of the agenda. We see that also, by the way, in the German election campaign, Europe was not an issue. Afterwards, it now is. Um, so I think that he will try not to put that high on the agenda. He will not portray himself as the Sorbonne president as he was a couple of years ago. He will be also strongly um, uh, uh, inserting into the debate. He has already done so issues which are more leaning towards the right when it comes to migration issues. Um, and then you have the phase which comes after the presidential elections. Um, so this is May and June. And provided that Macron will be reelected, I think that he will reinsert himself into the debate. Don't forget, this will be the final phase of the conference on the future of Europe. If it's not Macron, we're in a totally different ballgame, depending on who the, other, the new president would be. So I see these three moments. Thank you. Johannes, a quick word on this, and then let's turn back to the Franco-German relationship. I think uh, Jan is exactly right uh, when making this distinction of, of the three phases. Um, I also think um, we will see tremendous efforts of, of the French government um, when it comes to uh, especially the big packages, the digital package, uh, Fit for 55, um, especially in that first phase, um, followed by this relatively uh, um, no, yeah, weak phase uh, during the high phase of the uh, presidential election. And then during the last um, two months of the presidency, this um, uh, if, if Macron gets re-elected, of course, this a uh, big push for European reform. Also, um, this will be the moment um, that when also the, the German government will probably be um, have settled itself uh, domestically and be able to uh, play a bigger role on the on the European level. Um, so these these two timelines might be coinciding and then also give new impetus for the strategic debate around Europe, but also in the context of the conference on the future of Europe. Absolutely. And Johannes, let me stay with you on this question now of the Franco-German uh, relationship. I've seen it described the coalition agreement as a win for President Macron because it contained some elements of things that he has been very much championing. Is that how you see it? Fabian said earlier, so much depends on what happens at the Franco-German level now. How do you see that relationship based on what we know? And John Palmer was asking, are we broadening out now beyond we always used to talk about the Franco-German engine. Is it much more a bigger engine driving the EU or do you still expect that to be dominant? And what difference would it make if Macron loses? Johannes first, same question to you all. Yeah, I think um, we, uh, we will still see uh, um, that the Franco-German relationship will be uh, the, the most important uh, relationship for Berlin. Um, that is um, uh, institutionalized uh, deeply uh, with several agreements, uh, most recently with the Treaty of Aachen, but also um, in form of the, the Franco-German Parliamentary uh, Assembly. So there will be this, this deep focus of, um, of Berlin towards, towards um, uh, Paris. But uh, interestingly, we also see that the coalition agreement opens um, uh, the door for, for other formats, um, especially um, uh, including also uh, Poland um, together with France um, uh, to, have, to have a closer relationship between the three of them. Um, so um, I think, uh, yes, France will 
be it the first advocacy of the government, but uh, we might also see a, um, a broadening of the approach. Yes. And just briefly, if you would, Johannes, before I uh, give a final word to, to Fabian and to Yanis, this question of uh, Russia, Ukraine uh, and the EU Eastern Partnership, um, how do you see uh, and what role do you think that engine might play there? Yeah, I think um, in more general, um, the the coalition agreement, not only the coalition agreement, but uh, the new um, foreign minister, uh, Annalena Baerbock, um, has pledged to uh, follow a more um, resolute approach um, uh, towards countries like uh, Russia, but also China, um, a more value-based, um, human rights-based approach, and was very strong, um, uh, while not mentioning Russia uh, directly in uh, um, um, conveying security for for the Ukraine. So I think towards Russia, we will see a, a stronger approach of, of um, the new government under Baerbock. Thank you. Yanis, and then the last word will go to Fabian. In terms of what does this changing of the guard in Berlin mean for the Franco-German relationship? Do you think we will see a broadening of the bilateral into the multilateral, as John put it? Uh, these new formats Johannes was talking about, how do you read it? And Two words, because we let's not be too hypothetical. What happens if Macron loses? Well, I think that the change of guard in Berlin means that there is an opportunity to re-dynamize the relationship between Paris and Berlin. Um, there is an opportunity to not only on paper, Johannes was mentioning Aachen, the Treaty of Aachen, but in real terms, not only agree on certain things, but then also to proactively push them on the European agenda. Because we saw a lot of nice words, which actually there was not, there was not political capital being put into that. I think there's a chance now to do so, provided that the, on the other side of the Rhine, and meaning in Paris, he will have a president who is willing to do so. If that's Macron, we, we can assume that this will be the, the case. If it's Pécresse, I would also assume that it would be the case, but it would be a different ballgame. They would have to also get used to each other. Um, so I think that there's a lot of potential. I don't see, by the way, that we see other coalitions emerging and that we now will have a coalition which will include the, the Italians or the Spanish. Um, on times, yes, but in structural ways, I think Berlin, Paris has been and will remain the main axis. Having said that, and that links also to the question by Milan, uh, Milanich with respect to Eastern partnership, mm -hmm. I think what we have seen is that Chancellor Merkel in the past has been someone who has a, who had a strong focus um, also on Paris, but she also had a strong focus on Eastern Europe, and she was also listening to smaller and medium-sized member states. And I think that she that also Schultz now that goes also with the Eastern Partnership Summit. We want to go there to showcase. I am also someone who you should be talking to when it comes to issues which concern you. There will be an open ear in Berlin also for you because there are already these talks in town that potentially Schultz might deal with these countries, with these partners differently. I think so he will try to send this song, strong signal of openness and of coalition readiness. Thank you very much. Fabian, a last thought from you. You were the one who said this was the central question, the central issue. How do you read it? Let me just also answer one question which you posed to me and which I didn't answer. Maybe I was trying to avoid the Brexit <laughs> question. Um, but um, I, I think uh, you, you were asking about uh, the influence of Brexit on the, the French presidential election and vice versa. Um, I mean, what we have seen, um, particularly on the migration issue, is extraordinary. I mean, this is um, essentially leaders accusing each other of misrepresenting, of lying. Uh, the language um, has been extremely tense. Um, now, does that mean uh, this will have a big role to play in the French presidential election? For the moment, I don't think so. Um, I don't think it is a core issue, although there are some issues which are important also in the French presidential election. If we look at, for example, Northern France and the fishermen, yeah. there, there is an, uh, an issue there. But if it does become an election issue, um, so if there is, for example, a provocation from London, um, which uh, there will then uh, result in a very strong reaction. And I think there is a danger there that if it becomes a big issue in the election, that the relationship really deteriorates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, briefly, if you would, on the future yeah, sure, of the relationship. On, on, on the Franco-German, I think it's, it's important to say uh, it's a necessary condition for making progress, but it's not a sufficient condition for making progress. Um, there's a lot which has to happen. 
it doesn't happen if France and Germany don't agree fundamentally, um, mm. then you can't make any progress. But you have to build these wider coalitions as well. It is no longer the case that France and Germany can just drive the whole European card forward. Um, I think there will be um, a stronger impetus as already been mentioned. It will depend also on particular issues. Um, we can already see uh, there are differences um, with the new government. I mean, I already mentioned uh, the signaling, for example, about China is very yeah. different than what was there before. Uh, some of the issues like rule of law are going to play a different role. So I, I think we are going to see that cooperation between France and Germany. But the big question for me, um, and that we don't know yet, um, is whether we will get as Europe as a whole, not just those two countries, will get out of this crisis response mode. Yeah. Whether we will really start to develop some form of vision for the future, some form of a more strategic direction, or if we just continue to react to whatever is on the table on the day. And that we simply don't know. I think that depends a lot also on the ambitions of the individual. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm sure we're going to come back to all of these issues again, uh, most notably. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll be back with the post summit briefing and EPC update combined on the afternoon of December the 17th uh, to analyze Olaf Scholz's first summit, uh, where we are with Omicron and the general COVID response. Lots of issues to come back to. Um, that is all we have time for today. Just a couple of events to mention to watch out for next week. On Monday, taking stock one year after the EU-UK trade agreement. Uh, also on Monday, EPC talks geopolitics with Fiona Hill, former deputy assistant to the US president and now with the Brookings Institution. And on Wednesday, a session on climate security. Uh, the aspect of this week, perhaps focus on less most of the time, asks, do we need a joint NATO-EU strategy? As I say, we'll be back on December the 17th. But thank you very much, Fabian, Yanis, and particularly to Johannes. Thank you for sharing your expertise and fascinating insights. And thank you for going through that coalition agreement with a very fine tooth comb and highlighting what the rest of us who either don't speak German uh, or don't know how to read the nuances couldn't pick up. It was fabulous to have you with us, Johannes. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining us. Have a Good weekend, despite the snow, the grey, the wet, uh, and we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks' time. Bye-bye. <laughs>